Amen, amen. Bless the Lord. Remain standing, please. Remain standing, please, and turn from your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9, and I'm reading this morning from the uh, New King James translation of the Holy Scripture. Nehemiah chapter 9, and I want to pick up uh, reading uh, in Nehemiah chapter 9 with verse 7. I'm going to read uh, several verses, and we're going to try to finish surveying the ninth chapter of the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 9. Uh, beginning with verse 7. <clears throat> you are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldees and gave him the name Abraham. You found his heart faithful before you and made a covenant with him to give the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, and the Gergesites to give it to his descendants. You have performed your words, for you are righteous. You saw the affliction of our fathers in Egypt and heard their cry by the Red Sea. You showed signs and wonders against Pharaoh and against all his servants and against all the people of his land, where you knew that they acted proudly against them. So you made a name for yourself, as it is this day. And you divided the sea before them, so they went through the midst of the sea on dry land, and the persecutors you threw into the deep. And as they throw stone into the mighty waters, moreover you led them by day with a pillar, with a cloud pillar, and by night with a pillar of fire to give them light on the road which they should travel. You came down also on Mount Sinai and spoke with them from heaven and gave them just ordinances and true laws, good statutes and commandments. You made known to them your holy Sabbath and commanded them precepts, statutes, and laws. By the hand of Moses, your servant, you gave them bread from heaven for their hunger and brought them water out of the rock for their thirst and told them to go to possess the land which you had sworn to give them. May the Lord's rich blessing be to his word. May it be sanctified in our hearts. Father, we thank you for your word, for your word gives light. Now speak to us that we might see Jesus in all of his majesty, splendor, and glory, and that our hearts, our minds, our souls, and our spirits might be caught up in great ecstasy as we worship him. For it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. You may be seated. I want to continue our message this morning in part two of the message we started on last week of a, a recipe uh, for revival, a recipe uh, for revival. Now, you ladies like to share recipes. Uh, anytime women are invited to someone's house and they taste a dish that is very delicious and voluptuous and it causes the, the taste buzz to get excited, first thing, girl, give me that recipe. <laughs> and, and women will take somebody else's recipe and they add a little bit of this and add a little bit. They got to change the rest. Then it becomes their recipe. There's nothing like a good recipe for a good dish uh, that women can whip up. And some of these men here are quite chefs themselves. Brother Lawrence Sharp and Brother Joe Fowle and Brother Parnell Legros. They're, they're quite chefs themselves and have their own specialty recipes. Well, God has the right as the divine chef to delineate the ingredients that should go into a recipe that would result in a revival. As believers, we all want to see revival. We want to see a renewal. We want to see a return to God. And we yearn and long and we ache for a spiritual renaissance, uh, to see things the way they used to be in terms of family structures and people going to church and to live in neighborhoods where we no longer have the dead boat and to lock our doors and put alarms on our vehicles and, and theft prevention devices to keep people from stealing the stuff that we work to obtain. We long for yesteryear, which may never return, but we still can believe God for revival. We can believe God that men and women and boys and girls' hearts can be turned back to the Lord. Uh, this morning during my radio time, I did this impassioned plea to the young men of this community, the young women of this community to 
to move away from the violence and the drugs and from the guns and the so forth. And I made a strong plea as I know how to make, pleading for someone to turn their heart to the Lord. And that did not happen, but one young man did call and called us. I'm in a lifestyle I know I need to get out of and uh, pray, pray for me. And he hung up. And so that still, my heart was encouraged that one person that was listening, one person that realizes they need to make a change. And revival can start with just one person. When this Old Testament book of Nehemiah, we're looking at Nehemiah, this incredible leader who lived around 440 B.C. and who had been born in, in Persia during the exile and who had risen to a place of a cabinet position in the king of Persia's cabinet, but whose heart was still torn and rent and broken over the condition of the holy city, the place of his father's and grandfather's birth, the holy city of, of Jerusalem. And so he received the report that Jerusalem was still way desolate, that the wall was still down, the gates were still in ashes and rubble, the economy was depressed, there was violence in the street, there was oppression of the have, over the have-nots, children were being sold, sold into slavery. He was moved to basically turn his heart toward Jerusalem and to come back and become the leader that they needed. And so Nehemiah serves to us as a, a paradigm, a model of a 21st century leader. And true leadership looks at a situation, it assesses the situation, and it doesn't point its bony finger trying to blame anybody. True leadership said, this is the pathology, this is the problem that we have here. And leadership says, it's our problem together. Come, let us joint venture together, and let's seek the God of heaven to see if he will not disseminate a solution, and let's see if we can't trust God to help us get up out of this mess. And that's what Nehemiah does. And so he deals first with the physical condition of the city because he needs to get momentum. If people are living in dilapidated conditions, if people are not receiving the right type of medical care, if they're hungry, if people are struggling just to make ends meet, it's hard to move them to their spiritual condition. So he deals with their physical reality. So he rallies the people, and in a wreck of 52 days, they rebuild the walls and they rehung the gates, what they had not been able to do in 130 years. They did in 52 days. Because the people had a mind to build, and they had a, a leader with vision and with passion willing to sacrifice to serve the people. And he was able to get them to see that we don't have to stay in the mess that we're in. So seeing the physical, aesthetic change of Jerusalem, Seeing the economy now being revived because the gates are now hung, now the merchants feel secure and putting their wares out on the street in the marketplace so the economy can be reborn. And now there is some excitement and there is electricity in the air and then Nehemiah seizes the moment to not allow the people to be delusionary to believe that revival had come just because they were now able to get employment. The revival had come because they just bought a brand new house, a new chariot, or a new fleet of horses, or a couple of changes of clothing. But that doesn't mean that God is necessarily blessing, because the heathen normally drive better cars, wear better clothes, and live in better houses than the righteous on this side. So Nehemiah then forces them to look at their spiritual condition, so he goes and he gets the ready scribe, a man by the name of Ezra. And they built a makeshift pulpit in the public arena, and he called for a holy convocation, and he brought all the people together, and Ezra took the scroll, he took the word of God. And he stood elevated among the people, and Ezra began to read the word of God. And Nehemiah had strategically placed the Levites and the scribes among the people so they could interpret to the people what the word of God meant. And as they heard God's word read, as they heard God's word explained, they begin to realize we've not lived up to this word. And they begin to realize we are in this situation because our foreparents didn't live up to God's word. And so the downward spiral started with them and it continued with us and we continued this, this same downward spiritual spiral that it started with them. And so we can't blame them because we're responsible for what we have done or what we haven't done. And so this first ingredient to this recipe for revival is a return to the Word of God. Not for theatrical purposes, not for entertainment purposes, but to arrest people's attention that God speaks with profundity and God speaks perennially and God never shuts up and stops talking. 
What God has said, God continues to say, and God's voice still echoes down through the corridors of time as God raises up choice men and women who would dare to take their life in their own hands, respond to God's call to be God's prophetic voice to the people in their generation. And so the people hear the word of God, and the word of God will often arrest us because the word of God indicts us. It undresses us. The word of God goes in those private cracks and crannies of our lives, our own personal sanctuaries where we won't let anybody else in, and the word of God goes into those places, and it makes us feel uncomfortable. So we get mad at the preacher for meddling and think somebody told him something about us. Because God, God got our telephone number, our cell phone number, our email address, our zip code, and God can customize a word from heaven through one vessel to speak to a multitude of people. And so all these people standing there in the public square, one man reading God's word, but literally hundreds of them, i.e. thousands of them, are now starting to feel conviction for their sin. And so they hear the word of God, and the conviction leads to repentance. We saw that last week in verses 1 and 2. A repentance toward God, and repentance is a 180 degree turn. Repentance says I was going this way, and I turned around and I started going this way. The exact opposite direction. Repentance toward God simply means I stopped doing things the way I want to do them, and I turned to God and said, Lord, how do you want me to live my life? Repentance says I was going in the wrong direction. And man is the only creature who, is, who is, has been deceived into believing that you can go in the wrong direction, and if you speed up and start going faster, you can get to the right destination. And so we're speeding up the rate in which we sin. We're speeding up the rate on which we engage in ungodly activity, and for some kind of way, we think if we just floorboard it, we're going to get to the right destination. We're just going to get to the wrong place sooner. Repentance turns around 180 and says, I'm wrong. I'm just wrong. And some people who don't know Christ, they think that repentance means that I, by myself, got to change my life. No, repentance just says, I'm wrong. I'm in trouble. I'm in bad shape. I've been going in the wrong direction. I don't even know which way is up, down, right, from left. I'm just in trouble. And so repentance just turns and cries out to the Lord. So they repent, they turn, and they cry out to God. And it symbolizes in the Jewish culture this, this brokenness before God, and if they fasted, they realized our appetite's out of control, and it's our appetite that's got our, us, us in trouble. Our food appetite, our appetite for sexual pleasure, our appetite for pride and fulfillment, it's our appetite that drives us and gets us in trouble. We bring our appetite under control, say, I'm repenting, I'm going to fast, I'm going to seek the face of God. And then there is a humility. They put on sackcloth, and the Jews, like Not unlike us, they prided themselves in how they dressed. And if you look at ancient Israel today, I mean, many of them still wear the ancient garb. Those are beautiful garments. And they take great great pride in the garments that they wore. And in the old world, a person's wealth and affluence was often in the garments that they had. And so they take off their royal regalia and they put on sackcloth. And it's itching them and making them feel uncomfortable. Because sin makes you feel uncomfortable in the presence of God. They put on sackcloth. They're fast. They humble themselves. They consecrate themselves. They separate themselves from the ungodly folk they've allowed to come in and intermingle with them. And they have been imitating and emulating the lifestyle and the value system of the ungodly. Evil communication corrupts good manners. You lay with dogs, you get up with... That's grandma's theology 101, right? But it's biblical. And so they turn and they confess to God. Then there is a return to the word of God again. Not now more than just reading the word of God, but a real response to the word of God. And they respond again with confession. And they respond again with worship. And in verse 4, the leaders cry out to the God on behalf of the people. And in verse 5, they say, bless his holy and glorious name. So the first ingredient in this recipe for revival is for repentance toward God and a return to the word of God. And that will result in praise and in worship. And you can tell that the church is not in revival because there's not real, genuine, authentic praise among the congregation. 
And so even in those churches that call themselves charismatic Pentecostal, you got to have a hired holy man or woman to come up and work them up, work the folk up, work the folk up, because people don't come already with their cup running over. If God has blessed you to get up six days in a row by yourself or with help, and may let you get up even this, this day, which is the first day, but the seventh day if you started getting up, talking about getting up on Monday. And if God has clothed you and if God has fed you and gave you a reasonable portion of health and strength, full activity of your limbs, and able to think thoughts about yourself, even if the thought is nothing but how bad it is, you got a reason to be blessed and show up at the church with your hands already clapping, praise already in your lips, and a dance already on the feet, because God has been good to us. God has been good to us. But because we have been initiated into this spiritual elite club of the entitled, our assumption is, is that my tomorrow ought to be better than yesterday. And death tomorrow ought to be better than tomorrow. So our assumption is, because we can live on credit in this world system, our assumption is that we automatically ought to be able to have something better the following day simply because we are entitled to it. But great is his mercy which are renewed each morning. So revival will manifest itself in repentance. People turn away from sin. Revival also will manifest itself, manifest itself with this third ingredient of praise and worship. And I want to work my way through this text, but I think it's worth the effort and the time to do it. Nehemiah chapter 9. So verse 6 and 7, we saw last week, the first thing they do, they praise God for what he's done. We don't spend a whole lot of time praising God that the sun keep on shining. And that the moon still is out most nights and the stars are still hanging up in the sky. Because if God, by his divine omniscience, would just say, stars, y'all just fall, we'll be in a heap of trouble. One of the fears that astronomers have and astrologers have, they're fear that we're going to get hit by some giant meteorite, all type of stuff out there flying in the universe. And if one of them would come there and hit us and knock us off of our orbit just a small, minute degree, we'd freeze to death or burn up to death. We'd thank God just because he keeps stuff running the way he did the day before. They bless him for the creation because they know all of their substance, everything they have is because creation is here. And God allows the hydrological cycle, and God allows the earth to continue to rotate and spin, and God allows the seasons. They understand that they are tied directly to the land. And that's one of the problems when you get removed from the land. You see, most people think the cabbage is grown in Kroger's. You see what I'm saying? That's, they think they grew it somewhere back there in Kroger's. And so we're removed from the land. How many people here had a garden this past year? Let's go to Deacon Mitchell's house. He got the only healthy food in town. They got chemicals and pesticides and insecticides on it. We don't even grow stuff no more. We got land out there, and we cutting it instead of growing something on it. When you get removed from the land, the farther you get removed away from the land, it's easy to get removed from God because you don't see your dependency upon God. You don't see the fact that the weather got to be just right, enough sunshine and enough rain. The cycle got to be just right for the crops to grow properly. But people who are tied to the land because they're in a wearing society, because they have livestock, farms, and and cattle, and goats, they understand how critical it is that the creation just keep going like it's supposed to. They bless God for it. They go on after blessing God for that. They bless him for the call and the covenant of Abraham. That's a blessing for the spiritual heritage in verse 7. They understand that their relationship with God started somewhere with somebody else. And that's why I shared that with you last week. We got to get back to this idea that we have a history. Everything didn't just start with us. Somebody didn't sacrifice. Someone laid a spiritual foundation. Somebody prayed. Someone sought the face of God. Somebody got saved that allowed us to be grafted into the family of God. So they linked themselves to Abraham. And they realize we ain't always been a bunch of misfits. We haven't always been a bunch of knuckleheads. We come from a rich spiritual heritage. So they thank God for their spiritual heritage. They then praise and they bless God for his deliverance. Again, they understand we come from something, and we come from a people that have come from something. And that's what we don't do well today. We don't tell the story, and we don't tell the history of our family and the history of the people group that we descended from. If you were born in the projects, if your mama was born in the projects, if your grandmama was born in the projects, and as far back as you can go is to the projects, if that's all you can go back to, 
then it's hard to believe that maybe the cycle can be broken with me. But when you understand there was somebody that's done did something in your life somewhere at some time that's bigger than that, and you're linked and you're tied to something larger than your present reality. Are you following me? And all people groups are tied and they're linked to a rich history and a rich lineage and a rich ancestry because if you weren't, then you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't have survived. The seed wouldn't survive. And so when all the people groups start talking about where they came from, from Ireland and from France and from Spain and from these places, that's a wonderful thing because you need to know you came from something. And so I say to African-American folk, if you have ancestry in Africa, well, only the smartest survived and the strongest because millions died just trying to be bought here on ships. So if you, if, if, if you got somebody... They got here, that means that physically they had to have a real physical strong presence of battle. They also had to have a strong mental constitution because some committed suicide because they couldn't deal with the horrors of slavery. You're part of something is all I'm trying to tell you. You're linked to something is what I'm trying to tell you that is significant. And it's important that you understand that and link yourself to that to realize that God has been working through my ancestors and God has been working through those who came before me. And now things are culminating upon me. And everything that happened before me sets the stage for God to do something in and through me and my family and in my situation. That's the way you got to look at stuff. You got to look at it like that. You got to understand that you will not just put in you and I to eat, drink, and to be merry and have Holy Ghost parties and spiritual pep rallies. We will put in a bar witness to the reality of a resurrected king, a savior called Jesus, and see how many people we can convince to follow this lowly Nazarene into the kingdom of God. And so the dark of the moment, it sets the stage for a greater manifestation of God's glory and power. And that's why every Jew knows their history, and they understand it, and they can cite, recite it by heart. And here these folk been cut off, their foreparents had went into slavery in 586 B.C., and now it's about 440 B.C. So 140 years have passed, they done lost the Bible, didn't have a couple copy of the scroll, but everybody know the story. And they stand now, and as they're praising and worshiping God, they're reciting back to God their history because their history is his story. History is his story, the story of how God has moved, how God has worked, how God has made a way, and that's all they do right here. So they talk about his deliverance, how he brought their four parents up out of Egyptian slavery, verses 9 through 11. They talk about his guidance, something many people would have forgotten. They had been slaves in Egypt for over 400 years. They didn't have no map. They didn't have no compass. Wasn't no map quest and wasn't no AAA. They didn't know where they was going. They didn't know where they were going. They, all they knew was working in Egypt. Now they're out in slavery going to a place they ain't never seen before. So God guided them. A pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. Sometimes you're to stop and you're to pause and you're to thank God for guiding you. Because some of us, you could have took a wrong step and you could have ended up over here. You could have took a wrong step and ended up crippled, ended up in prison, incarcerated. You could have took a wrong step and ended up hurting somebody. You thank God that he guided you around some pitfalls and some potholes. And when you look back, you say, my God, I wasn't smart enough to miss that pothole. I wasn't smart enough to guide God guided you. So you thank God for his guidance. And then in verses 16 through 18, they thank God for his provision. Verse 15, the same bread that their ancestors had complained about, that manna, that heaven's food, they realized that's what sustained them. They would have starved to death out there in the wilderness, but God provided for them, and God sustained them. And he said for 40 years they wandered around in the wilderness, and their clothes didn't wear out, and their shoes didn't wear out, and their feet didn't swell because of the good hand and the good mercies of God. Oh, I wish I could have a witness up in here. Now we got art supports in our shoes. It used to be a time, you know, we'd walk around feet hurting, feet flat, shoe wore out, the thing that just caved down in the bottom of the shoe. And now we can afford to go to get inner souls and get art supports and get doctor shows and all that type of business. And we're to thank God for his provision. And then in verse 16 or 18, 
We're to thank God for his part. And he said, we were just a bunch of knuckleheads. Our ancestors were knuckleheads. Verse 16, they hardened their necks. They didn't keep your commandments. 17, they refused to obey, and they were not mindful of your oneness. They did that you did among them, but they hardened their necks, and they rebelled, and they appointed a leader to return to bondage. But you are God ready to pardon. A spiritual insurrection. After being brought up out of Egypt, after being fed heaven's food, after God had caused their clothes not to wear out, they decided we don't want to serve God, and they appointed themselves a leader, build a golden calf, take us back to Egypt. And you didn't wipe them out. You pardoned them. You forgave them. The older I get in this thing called a ministry, the more compassion I have for folks. The worst person I know when I look at them, I said, man, they, they've been through something. And I don't know if I could have survived what they've been through. I may have killed myself or killed somebody else. You begin to realize that everybody got a history, everybody got a story, and people have been abused and neglected. They've been manhandled, they've been mauled. And that doesn't excuse their deviant behavior, but as the people of God, it ought to cause us to be compassionate to understand, man, we were bad as Jesse James too. And only the grace of God steered our heart in another direction because God put some people in our lives and they put up some bumpers. You know, and, and for y'all good bowlers, y'all don't know nothing about bumpers. But for those of us who can't bowl very well, I just told them, just put me over in Kittyville. Because I don't want all my bowls going over in the gut. I want to hit some pins. So they inflate these circular uh, inner tubes. They lay them down in the gutter. And so when you throw your ball, don't go how raggedy your ball is, it'll hit them things and it'll bounce back and it'll knock down some pins. And you can feel good about yourself. <laughs> you can feel good about yourself. And you ought to thank God that through life, somewhere along the way, God had some people and they were bumper guys. And just when you were getting ready to roll over in the ditch in the gutter somewhere, you bumped up against somebody. And just bumping up against them sort of sent you back the other way so that you didn't spiral out of control. And God spurred today so you can come to know him and be forgiven. So they thank him. They thank him for his pardon and for his forgiveness. Verse 19, they thank him for his faithfulness. For his faithfulness. Yet in your manifold mercies, you didn't forsake them in the wilderness. The pillar of the cloud did not depart from them by day to lead them on the road. Nor the pillar of fire by night to show them light. And that they, the way they should go. Even though they were lost, God wouldn't let them be lost. They ain't know where they were, and they ain't know where they were going. But God knew where they were, and God knew where they were going. And so he knew how to make them just keep going around in a circle so they wouldn't really be lost, lost. <laughs> so at times, God just keeps us going around in a circle so we won't be lost, lost. See, it's better off to be going around in a circle than be going off in a straight line lost somewhere. Because as long as you're in that circle, you can't be with so lost. You understand? That's why they built them cities. In the city, they built these beltways. You can't be with so lost in the city. You go on the 495 beltway, you go on the 610 beltway, you can't be with so lost. Because the thing just keep going around the, the, the interstate. Just keep circling around the city. So you just keep something, you just keep taking exits and getting back on. Eventually, you're going to get the right one. So God sends us around a spiritual beltway sometime just so we can get used to the scenery. He wouldn't let them be with so lost. He was faithful to them. Verse 20, he, he allowed his spirit to appear and be among them and upon some of them. Verse 21, he just kept, kept on sustaining them, as I referenced earlier, when they were 40 years in the circle. The shoes didn't wear out and their feet didn't swell. Verse 22, he gave them significance. See, when you got something, you got some significance. Moreover, you gave them kingdoms and nations and divided to them districts, so they, pos they took possession of the land of Sihon, the land of king of Heshbon, the land of Ah, king of Bashan. You multiplied their children, the stars of heaven. You gave them significance because you gave them kingdoms. People who hadn't had nothing, they were born in Egyptian slavery and hadn't had anything, and now they rise up, and in 40 years, the heads of states and their leaders and over nations and over empires. You made something out of us when we were nothing. 
That's what I'm trying to tell this generation of children that your know, God is no respecter of persons and anybody will humble themselves of the mighty the hand of God. God will lift them up and God will elevate them. And some of you, you don't realize that God has placed inside of you world-class ability and talent and skills, but you got to work it out. As the Bible says, work out your own soul's salvation in fear and in trembling. It is God that works in you both to will and to do according to his good pleasure. Are you following me? I don't, I don't say this in a boastful and arrogant way, so I hope you don't misunderstand me. But I know I got some world-class ideas that will line up with anybody's ideas anywhere. I just chose to stay here and you keep working right here with them. To see if we can get some of them implemented right here. And if God might show up right here and do something significant and great and magnanimous that will call the whole world's attention to a little old place in Charleston, West Virginia, on the west side of Charleston, where God is doing great, marvelous, wonderful, magnificent, and splendid things. So I'm just looking for a handful of young folk that will follow me around and just pick up on some of these ideas. I ain't got time to work them all out. There's not enough time left, not enough energy left in this body. But there's some good ideas, and I'll give them to you. And pray that God will bless you and that God will take you places with these ideas and do things with these ideas that will result in many people coming to the saving faith of Jesus Christ, reaching their full, full potential, and standing in the arena and representing the true and the living God. He gave them significance. Then he gave them a legacy. He gave them children. Your children are your legacy. Your children are the link to the future. Your children's what gives you immortality. That a part of you keep on living. Even when they drop you down in the ground, throw dirt on your face, go back to the church and eat fried chicken, potato salad, rolls, and drink Kool-Aid, and talk about you for 15 minutes, and then 30 minutes later, they can't even remember your name. But your children, your seed, whether they're your physical children or your spiritual children, a part of you live on. And what I saw this morning, it was so beautiful. And all of us ought to start doing that. Watching Sister Mona Robinson walk with Sister Sarah Tina down the aisle to show her how to usher people into the church of God. Every adult ought to grab some young person and say, let me tell you what I know. Let me teach you what I know how to do. So that when you die, your gift don't die. And when you die, your passion doesn't die. And then maybe somewhere along life's journey, God will allow you to infect some young person with the germ of spirituality and commitment that you have. And so that when you go on away, your legacy continues. You gave us a legacy. Verse 26 to 32, and you've just been so patient with us, long suffering with us. Even when we were disobedient, disobedient, rebelled against you, 26, put our law behind our back so you couldn't kill the prophet. And that's what societies do, you know. They kill the prophets. And so in this culture, because we're not so barbaric as to physically exterminate the prophets, we try to marginalize the prophet. And so the man of God or the woman of God who's trying to tell the truth, we try to make them fanatical. We try to label them some way as being outside of the mainstream of thought. And we try to make them look like some deranged person rather than God's prophetic mouthpiece trying to speak the truth in a world that is spiraling out of control. They just stoned the prophets. They killed the prophets. That we can silence the prophets and maybe our conscience would not be bothering us. And that's the role the church doesn't want to play. The church wants to be so cozy with the political power structure and the economic and social power structure, the church no longer wants to be the conscience. And the church has to be a conscience, a constant agitation against what's not right and what doesn't line up with God's word. And when you take that position, Jesus said, why are you so upset? They persecuted you. They persecuted me. And you don't live nearly with the regal righteousness that I live with. You only got just a little bit of it. So why would you think they'd treat you any differently from me? So you know they killed the prophets. The Lord was still patient to them. And then in verse 33 through 35, I don't have time to look at all the verses. They, they praise God for his justice. For his justice. You see, real repentance always brings you to the justice bar of God. And you realize, what I'm getting, I deserve, and even more. And that's, what that's where they came to. Look at verse 33. He says, however, you are just in all that has befallen us. 
That's what they're saying. They say, everything that's happened to us, we deserve it. You are just in allowing us to be in slavery. You are just in allowing us to be oppressed, and we're working hard, and somebody else is profiting from our labor, and you're perfectly just to do that because it's the only way you can get our attention. Verse 34, neither our kings nor our princes, our priests nor our fathers have kept your law nor heeded your commandments and your testimony which you have testified against them for they have not served you in their kingdom verse 35 or the many good things that you've given them verse 35 or in the large rich land which you set before them nor did they turn from their wicked works here we are servants today and the land you have gave to our fathers to eat its fruit and its good things here we are servants in it and it yielded much increase to the kings you have set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle and their pleasure. We are in great distress. And I'm not going to try to make this a perfect fit. But you look at this country, our spiritual roots and our spiritual heritage and what we tried to stand for. And now we got all of this wealth and we got all of these resources. And now we got to pay all this money for gasoline and for oil. And so the money ends up going to people who don't even like us, who are trying to kill us, who want to annihilate us. And we're the one place that's consuming the stuff that they have to be fed by. This vicious cycle. So now we're putting our money in our pockets, and it's like our pockets have holes in them. And we don't know how to wean ourselves from this dependency on this foreign oil, and much of our wealth now is leaving our country because we got to fight people that we don't like and don't like us. we got to try to secure our national defense through a military way, and we just all messed up. And we don't know which way is up. And we don't know which way to turn because when good men disagree, it means we don't know what we're doing. And that's exactly where we are. We don't have a national foreign policy to make much sense at all. Because even the people that we're trying to help don't like us, don't want us in their country, don't want our military on their land, and the only reason they allow it because we defend them from people that are bigger international gangsters than what they are. And so we find ourselves always between a rock and a hard place because we decided we don't really need God because we got all these missiles and we got these defense systems, we got nuclear bombs and all these things, and now some of these wackos got the, some of the same stuff we got. And now we live in a state of perpetual fear. But we're getting what we deserve. When a nation that has been blessed like this nation in such a short period of time and falls so far away from its founding principles, spirals out of control. But verse 38, I ain't going to leave you in that bad condition. And because of all of this, we, we, we make a covenant and we write it. And our leaders and our Levites and our priests seal it. And they said, Lord, we, we just want to do better. And we believe that you are a covenant God, a God of relationship. And we've confessed our sin and we've confessed our wrong and we really want to do better. And as we re rehearsed our history, we know that when your people turn back to you, there's something about your tender heart that you, you cannot resist a broken spirit and a contrite heart, and you cannot despise it. And so when we humble ourselves under your mighty hand, you will bend down to us, and you will attend to our cry. And you'll reach your loving arms around us, and you will embrace us, and you will pull us near and dear to yourself, and you'll whisper in our ear that you still love us with a love that will never let us go. Those are the seeds of revival, and revival is what we need, nothing less. A mighty move of God. Our social uh, somatics cannot change the situation. We need a mighty move of God. 
And I believe that we cry out to him and really mean business and we really want him above everything else. If we desire him and desire to be righteous and holy instruments in his hand, that God can use us not to save the old whole world, but at least to reach a couple of folk and create this new community of the redeemed people of God. We want shortcuts. We want to schedule it. Let's have a revival. So we schedule it for the fall. We're going to still be mean. We're going to be fussing all during the time we're planning it. <laughs> Arguing with folk. Not even speaking to folk trying to invite them to church. And we're going to invite all the choirs that can really sing and really throw down and make a lot of rack and a lot of noise. And invite a preacher that would really stir us all up. We're going to come and we're going to shout and we're going to jump and dance. And man, then we have revival. And then go back to living just as mean and cantankerous and hard to work with and hard to get along with and still will not pry our mouths open and invite nobody to church. Still not pry our mouths open and not say, don't you know that God loves you? Don't you know that God really can't help you? The recipe God has laid out. We got to hear God's word. We got to respond to God's word through repentance. We then return to God's word to learn how to live righteously. And then we realize that we really got to seek him. And one of the indications of our pursuit of God is reflected in our worship. It's reflected in our attitude toward worship. You know what's wrong with us in America? We're just lazy. Just lazy. We're just spiritually lazy. For those who play golf, if somebody said we're going to go out there on the golf course, a full cement at 8 o'clock, everybody going to be there at 730. Going to have the club already polished, already ready to go. Those who like to go to Morgantown to go to ball game, 12 o'clock game. We're going to leave here at 7 o'clock. We're going to meet the rush. We're going to get up there. We're going to be in the parking lot so we can tailgate and have a good time. We're going to be in our seat with the other 65,000 folk for kickoff because it's important to us. And we are passionate about it. But when it comes to worshiping God, we're not passionate about it. We're not really serious about it. If we get their own time, fine. If we don't, they ought to be glad we came anyhow. Well, it really ain't about me. I am glad that you came. But I'm not the one you ought to be trying to, uh, to uh, please. That's the one you'll be trying. Is he, is he approved? Does he approve of your attitude toward worship? Does he approve of your praise? And if you can say with a clear conscience that he does, then God bless you. And if there's any doubt about it, you ought to get it right. There's some things we can get right. We can't get everything right, and we can't always be right, but we can get some things right. And we can say, I'm going to approach every time I have the worship of God with enthusiasm and with zeal, and it's going to be a high priority, and I'm going to show in my attitude toward worship, I really mean business with God. I think if we get that right, I think God will help us. And I think God will do something big in our midst. And we, we can be a, be a part of something great, something grand. God is no respect of persons. He really isn't. He's no respecter of people, of places, of personalities. God would do a mighty work through us. And that's my prayer for his glory and the furtherance of his kingdom. And I pray that he will start doing it right today. Let's bow together, shall we? Maybe you're here this morning. And you've been thinking about getting saved. Now is the time. Today is the day of salvation. None of us are promised another second. All we have is the present tick of the clock. God loves you. He has been patient toward you. He has been long-suffering. He has been forgiven toward you. He really does. And Jesus Christ 
came into this world and lived a perfectly sinless life and was betrayed to be crucified. And when he died on the cross, he died in your place and in my place and the place of every other person that would ever live. He took in his body the full punishment for our sin. The punishment for sin has already been paid. It has already been exacted in the sacrificial substitutionary death of Christ. His blood is the only payment that God will accept for sin. And to prove it, God raised him from the dead and said, I am satisfied with the sacrificial substitution or death of my son, and whoever calls on his name, who will put their faith in him, I will pardon them, I will forgive them, I will grant them eternal life. If you're here today and you've never trusted Christ, today is the day. Now is the time. Don't let the enemy deceive you into thinking you got to get everything right before you can come to God. No, we come to God realizing we've gotten everything wrong. And that only God can help us, only God can forgive us. If you're here today, you sense a need, you have a desire, right where you are, just say to the Lord, Lord, I know that I am a sinner. I know I do not deserve to be forgiven. But I believe that you love me and that you died in my place, and that you were raised from the dead, and I put all my faith in you. Come into my life and save me, Lord Jesus. If you pray that simple prayer and meant it from your heart, then God has promised he would hear your prayer, he would hear your cry. And I just want you to raise your hand if you prayed that prayer, and someone's going to come and pray with you and talk to you to help you get started on the right path. Don't be ashamed. Jesus Christ died for us in public, and therefore we ought to acknowledge him in public and not be ashamed of him. Now is the time. Today is the day. There will not be a more opportune time. There will not be a better time. There will not be a more convenient time. This is your hour of salvation. This is the day. Give your life to Christ today. Trust him today and let him save you, and start you on an exciting adventure of a personal relationship with him. Is there one who prayed that prayer? Just raise your hand. Is there one? Is there one who wants to be saved? Maybe you already are saved, and you realize you need to recommit your life to Christ and really serve God the way God is calling you to serve him, then let this second Sunday in August 2006 be the time that you settle it once and for all. I'm going to serve the Lord with whatever life I have left to live. Is there one? You need to rededicate your life to Christ, resurrender your life to Christ. Now is the time. Today is the day. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning my hope shall rise to Thee, only Thou art Holy, merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed shrimp. Sing that second stanza, holy, holy, holy.
continue to sing to the Lord. Holy, 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 whom the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinful man thy glory may not see. Thou art holy, there is none beside thee, perfect in power and love and purity. Holy, holy, holy. us to be holy. And he's promised that he would consecrate us and separate us unto himself. And I pray as you leave this place today, you'll leave, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, with a burning desire to represent him, to tell others about him, to testify of his greatness in your life, to not be paralyzed by this spirit of this age of negativity and complaining, but to see the good hand of God and the simple things of life, to see the manifold mercies of God, even in the complexities of life, and testify of his greatness. And even when you're going through a hardship, difficulty and pain, and when your heart has been broken, and when you don't know which way you're going to turn, you stand up and you testify like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And he will deliver you in your hour of trial. Eternal God, now Father, we thank you. We thank you for your people. What a beautiful people they are. What a grand and a glorious people you've called them to be. Now bless them and encourage them today and lift their spirits and cause them to think high and lofty thoughts about you. And as they're entertaining those thoughts, they say, but I'm connected to him. That's the God that lives inside of me. And may that challenge them and inspire them, motivate them and lift them, Lord, to attempt great things for you and to see you do great things in and through them and not despise their inheritance and their call and their ministry. And to realize, Lord, that we are indeed a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people to show forth your praise and your glory. Now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only true and the living God, the God and Father of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the one is able to keep you from falling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding great joy. To him be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever.